everybody. Uh, my name is Matthew McClure. Um, as she said, I work for Brightcove. Uh, so we're a video company. Um, we do pretty much everything from transcoding to playback and kind of everything in between. Um, but in the last few years, we've started transitioning from um, big monolithic applications to microservices. Um, so this has meant that we've been breaking up a lot of things and building uh, really small applications. Uh, and so I was uh, on part of one of the teams that was one of the first to put containers out into production. Uh, and so we used CoreOS for this. Um, and so this is kind of walking through our, uh, what the tool that we built to kind of help facilitate that. Um, so uh, let's see. Uh, before we get started, just to set expectations, um, Bluster solved and is solving a current problem that we had at Brightcove, um, and it's made our development life a lot easier. Um, so you might be asking, you know, where is this? Uh, is it open sourced? Am I going to announce this at the end? Um, and the answer is no. Uh, uh, it's still up for debate whether or not we even need to put it out there with recent um, uh, announcements, because um, we're we're. We kind of put things on a holding pattern when we started working on this because we saw bigger and better things coming down the pipeline um, and we were hope hoping for bigger and better things and then one of them came. I'm sure nobody has heard Technonic mentioned once during the last two days, um, but we're really excited about it. So uh, our, our path to CoreOS um, was pretty smooth for the most part and uh, you know, I start off by saying that CoreOS is fantastic at onboarding new customers. So whether it's via their um, you know, Vagrant setup or just clicking a launch stack button and getting a nice cloud formation, um, it's, been, it's been really, really nice. And uh, our initial testing was all cloud formation. Um, this made it really, really easy to just spin up and tear down clusters. We modified our cloud config file, spun up a new uh, cloud stack, tore down the old one. We did this over and over and over again. Uh, and it was really nice because it gave us um, a nice overview of uh, the CoreOS etcd fleet, uh, how all these things interact, um, and what we kind of needed to look out for. Uh, but the issues that we ran into were that autoscaling groups uh, left a lot to be desired. So, you know, say <clears throat> uh, you, you create an autoscaling group with an AMI version zero, uh, you let that run for, you know, two months, and then all of a sudden it spins up new instances. Now, CoreOS is recent, like what the rest of your cluster is running is AMI version 10, brings up version zero, bad. Uh, so what we felt about that was that we didn't want to deal with too much AWS magic. We uh, love AWS, for the most part, we're on entirely AWS, um, but we were, we were considering using other cloud providers, including our own, uh, data, uh, uh, our own data centers, so we didn't want to be totally locked down. Um, so what we wanted in a solution uh, was something that was cross-platform. Um, it didn't need to do everything up front. Uh, all we needed was AWS right off the bat, uh, but we still wanted the option to be able to add others later. Uh, we needed simple configuration files. So a big thing was it being human readable. I don't know if anybody here has ever touched a CloudFormation file, but it is the opposite of human readable. It is terrible. Um, so if we needed to add things to this thing later for other cloud providers, that was fine. We were okay with provider specific data being in there, um, but we just really wanted somebody else to be able to pick this up and see all the steps that we did to get to uh, a cluster. Um, and we wanted to be able to add instances really easily. So we didn't require anything crazy in terms of auto scaling. Um, our application that we were building was way underutilized um, by the time we got done spinning up three applications for uh, redundancy. Um, so we, we were okay with, with not being able to automatically scale up. We didn't need that. Uh, but we did want to be able to, just in case, bring new instances into the cluster easily. Um, and so all of that being said, we needed simple cluster creation. So we brought up different clusters for each environment, so QA, staging, production environments. Um, we wanted to be able to bring others online if we needed to. And uh, some people think this might sound like a, like a container CoreOS anti-pattern. Um, and I've heard both sides of that argument for us. Uh, we were kind of the core OS container canary, um, and I like living. Uh, so we wanted to play nice with sysenge. Um, we wanted to be able to uh, back out of this if necessary, and we wanted to uh, exist in the um, VPCs and in the architecture that they'd already had set up. So all of that being said, we needed simple cluster switching. So we needed to be able to easily, uh, in development, 
be able to just do something like change a git branch and then have your fleet commands go to this new cluster or to your QA cluster rather than your staging cluster or production. Um, and lastly, we were, we were okay with direct interaction with fleet and SCD. Our, our big thing here was not um, reinventing the wheel. We didn't want to build a new system to learn on top of these things. We just wanted some light sugar on top of uh, the existing control, uh, existing control um, applications, which was fine with us. So we, what we ended up building was this tool called Bluster. Um, and for the most part, it does everything that I mentioned before. So Bluster Bootstrap uh, is the first thing that we built. So this brings a new, uh, this brings a new cluster of CoreOS machines online. Um, it's basically the cloud config uh, just in a command line tool, um, or cloud formation in a command line tool. Uh, and so if you see here, there's a giant list of settings. There's things like uh, the VPC, the security group. Um, the first few times we ran this, we actually set all those, and then we realized that was an awful, awful, awful idea. Um, and so we started using uh, a JSON configuration file that you specify via config option. So this is what the uh, JSON configuration file looks like. As I said, it's really just uh, a reverse of the CloudFormation file, so these are all the things you would need there anyway, um, with some extras such as this current machines, um, these complementary services and primary services, and a discovery URL. Uh, so if you don't specify the discovery URL, uh, Bluster will go grab one from CoreOS, add it and save it. Um, these current machines need to be added after you bring the, core, the cluster online because you're going to use this for tunneling. And these complementary services and primary services were uh, used in what ultimately ended up being kind of a half-baked attempt at uh, deployment. Um, so the simple usage here, and this is awesome because... No. Oh, that was a bad idea, guys. I'm sorry. Oh, the worst part is it's local. Oh well. So we're going to uh, we're going to abandon these. So this was like one of those nice little ASCII cinemas that was going to be. That was a recording of my uh, command line utility, like running a setup. But uh, I just want you to imagine in that white space, uh, a command gets entered, and then three instances come online. So. It was awesome. Um, <laughs> uh, so then we needed to, okay. Now I no longer have my guide anymore, so this is going to be fun. Uh, so now we needed to be able to add instances. So Bluster add instances, it just uses the same configuration file that you used before. Um, so it uses the same VPC, security groups, the same discovery URL, um, and just brings a new machine into that cluster. Um, so, as you can see, the only things that you really need to specify are the number that you want to bring online, uh, the name of the uh, cluster. This should generally be the same name that you use to tag the other ones, but you could use something else. And then the uh, CoreOS AMI ID that you want to use. Uh, so then etcd. Um, this basically just uh, does almost nothing. It uh, tunnels into the cluster and runs SCD commands, which is really useful for us because we use that for things such as um, uh, Datadog configuration keys and things like that. Uh, so being able to do basic configuration and introspection into our SCD uh, uh, cluster was really, really nice. And so this is another uh, wonderful ASCII example that we see here. Um, so if you uh, Git checkout QA, run bluster etcd set foo to bar, um, and then you get that, you'll, you'll get back uh, bar for foo. If you then git checkout production, uh, foo wouldn't exist anymore because you're no longer on the same QA cluster. Uh, so just made it really, really easy to switch in between the different environments. Um, then there's fleet. This is basically the same thing. The, the TLDR here is that it really just prepends fleet CTL tunnel to commands. Um, and this same impact that we had from using um, etcd locally, this was really nice because we were able to um, easily use the same, or the same commands, the same tools for debugging um, as we were on the boxes, um, which made it a lot easier for people to kind of switch in between the actual cluster and their local, environment, their local development environment. Um, and then there's deploy, so I'll fly through these two. So deploy and like initialize were these kind of half-baked attempts uh, to do these things. Um, really what we ended up doing was 
um, running these things manually, um, but basically this relied on fleet net CD uh, to stop and start the service files. Um, it would be intelligent about waiting for certain etcd keys to be set again on startup so before it went on to the next one. Um, wonderful in theory, uh, generally we ended up feeling more comfortable just manually deploying, um, especially with the thought of we didn't want to spend too much time on something that we, we very well may throw away in a few months. Um, and that's the same thing with initialize. So the idea was that you could specify an array of uh, complementary services, start them, and then it would deploy your primary services. Uh, and the, you know, the configuration was easy to digest. You just know you want to deploy this array in order, uh, submit this service files in order, then start them. Those are generally things like um, global, uh, global service files, so Datadog runs on every machine, um, but really you're controlling that with the actual unit file itself. Um, and then your primary services are just the number you want to deploy and the template file. Um, so again, this is one of those things that was, you know, wonderful in theory, but when it works, it was uh, a bit of a bluster. Huh? huh? Anyone? No? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so bluster shortcomings, um, deploys are still for the most part manually. Um, we're okay with that. It's been great for like, you know, we can deploy uh, one or two units um, as canaries. If they're bad, just roll them back, it's fine. Um, it's a dumb tool, so you have to know what you're doing, which uh, I thought for a second, like, maybe that's a feature, um, but it's not. It actually, some awful things have happened because of that, like submitting template files and the uh, cluster being in a bad state for an hour or two while we try to figure out what the heck's going on. Um, if you've ever done that, then you know that is an awful, awful thing to debug. Uh, <clears throat> so do we regret any of this? Um, I personally don't. Um, we, we learned a lot. Uh, we, we do really love CoreOS and using it, um, so we think that this has put us in a great place moving forward. Um, we were able to debug a lot. Uh, since we use all these tools locally, they're the same. Um, and because of this, we really wanted somebody else to build a better solution. Um, and because of that, we're really excited about Tectonic. Even if we end up rebuilding a lot of this functionality that we've built in this, um, we think that Tectonic is a better base for it. Um, so if you're interested in talking about open sourcing this, come grab me. Um, uh, so the CoreOS guys came by the office the other day, uh, and one of our engineers was just like, yo, tell them their beard game is strong. Uh, so, so ever since, we've, we've called them the Council of Beards. Um, but yeah, so thanks everybody. Um, if you have any questions or comments, come grab me or ping me on Twitter or email. So, thanks. <laughs>